what were the disciples who and, and all of those those Hebrew and Jews that believed and followed the Messiah? What were they? Spilt milk? They were not God's chosen people? I need to rethink that, don't we? When, when people accuse you of replacement theology, this is what they're saying. Is that God's chosen people were the disobedient and their offspring and those that followed their religion to this day continue to be God's chosen people. However, the disciples and the, the, those that followed the Messiah and those that carried the gospel to the nations and were part of the church that Jesus said, I will build, they're not God's chosen people somehow. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border or watching it, if that's the case. Uh, this is our Prophecy Reality Edition. I'm Nicholas. And in this segment, we're going to talk about replacement theology. Now, I don't know how many of you out there are adherents to replacement theology, but uh, I have been accused of adhering to replacement theology. And I didn't even know what replacement theology was when I was accused of it, because I had never heard of it. As a matter of fact, I don't think uh, anyone really sat down and went, uh, decided that I'm going to write a thesis on a new belief, and I'm going to call it replacement theology. Because, uh, so I was doing a little research on replacement theology. Someone gave me a booklet by uh, David Hawking, who is a self-proclaimed Jew, and uh, also a pastor and a he does prophecy conferences too. And so uh, actually he's done several in the town near where I lived and I went there. I gave him a couple copies of my book and stuff like that and tried to talk to him. And the only good thing I can say about the guy is that, you know, he does stick to the authorized King James Version of the Bible and he speaks quite well on it. Yeah. But other than that, he just goes off because he is a Supposedly, he is a Jew. I don't know whether that's verifiable or whether he can, he can even actually know whether he, he's a uh, uh, actual genetic uh, descendant of the Hebrew race. So he may be a descendant of proselyte Jews, because there were a lot of them too. So the whole thing gets really iffy and questionable when you start talking about replacement theology. So doing a little more research into it, and I found an article, does anyone really, does anyone actually believe in replacement theology? And no, because the replacement theology is a negative theology. It's one that someone made up as an accusation. Yeah, exactly. Someone made up as an, and I'm sure there are people that, who haven't really researched, they just, they hear ideas like, oh yeah, the church replaced Israel. That sounds good to me, but is that really the case? Does anyone actually believe in replacing theology? And several years ago, when someone accused me, some some person who uh, loved everything Jewish and uh, loved the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, I heard one instance where um, someone was introduced in an evangelical church as a Jew, and the whole church got up and applauded them. For what? for just being Jewish. And so these people that usually accuse you of uh, believing in replacement theology, they're, well, I call them Jew worshipers. They worship flesh and blood men and women as if they were greater than other flesh and blood men and women. So anyway, I got accused of it. So I decided I came up with my own replacement theology. And here's how, here's, here's my replacement theology. God has faithful people on the earth, and they're called the people of God. They're God's chosen people. And they're also called other names like the elect in the scripture is another name for them. Um, in another place, they're called the remnant. When Jesus, and I believe Jesus first shows up in the 
uh, in Genesis at chapter 3 as the high priest of Adam and Eve, well, they were God's chosen people. They were, I guess, the only people at that time. But that was your first church meeting where the high priest showed up. But later on, we, we have the meeting of uh, uh, where God's chosen people are... Now we see a distinction between uh, those that are God's chosen people and those that are not, those that are elect and those that are not. We had Cain and Abel, and of course Adam and Eve, and brothers and sisters and other sons and daughters... Uh, and relatives that were born by that time. But the focus in the scripture is on Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, right? And uh, Cain was not part of the elect. He was not one of God's chosen people. And, and not, you've got to notice at this time also, there was no such thing as a Jew, okay? But these people were chosen. See, uh, then Seth was born. and And Eve says, God has given us a man to take the place of righteous Abel. See, because they were looking for that seed line of faith. They were looking forward to the promised Messiah that was promised to them at that first church meeting where Jesus stood at their, as their high priest and clothed them with the animal skins. Yes, he made the sacrifice for them. I believe that was a pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, they have a lot of different names for that, but I'll call it pre-incarnate. We could call it time travel, too. Jesus traveled back in time and took care of that business there. But he was the lamb slain for the, before the foundation of the world. So to us, what's time travel is probably not the same to him. But you get the idea of getting back to God's chosen people were before there was even a Jew or a nation of Israel. God, did you get in the picture? And so we have the seed line of faith that, that, that took up with Seth. So they were looking forward to the Messiah coming through the seed line of Seth. And that, that seed line of faith continued up through Noah, who made it through the flood. And it went on from there all the way up to when Jesus was born at the, at, and then appeared during the 70th week of Daniel. Yeah, the final is, a week that was uh, determined for the Jewish people, for their nation, for their holy city and their temple. And then it was done. The nation was no longer God's chosen nation. Now, God's chosen people and God's chosen nation are two different things. Because he did choose a nation for his purpose to be the, the focus of where his church, remember Paul called the uh, the children of Israel, the na national Israel, he called them the church in the wilderness. So Israel was a picture of the church, or the church is a picture of Israel. Take it either way. okay? And uh, it was like the church was Israel, was the visible church on earth was Israel. But inside that visible church on earth, in national Israel, was a remnant. Remember, the prophet lamented and said, there are none. And God corrected the prophet and said, I have yet 3,000 men. And that would include their wives and their, their families, their children, who have yet not bowed the knee to Baal in Israel. Oh, 3,000 amongst the millions of Israel, yeah, of the visible church on earth, there was only a remnant of elect. They are God's chosen people, not national Israel. National Israel was God's chosen nation, and, the, and he kept the promises of that nation to bring forth the Messiah. Once the Messiah was brought forth at the la and, and revealed to Israel, during its final and 70th weeks, remember 69 weeks unto Messiah, Jesus was revealed at the Jordan River baptism. Luke comments that he began to be about 30 years old, meaning he qualified to be of age to stand in as a high priest and take it and fill his role as high priest and eventually, three and a half years later, make the ultimate sacrifice as our high priest. Going back to the Genesis chapter 3, appearance of the high priest. Yeah. You see, it comes back full circle. 
So who are God's chosen people? And what is this replacement theology all about? Okay, well, my replacement theology is this. God has chosen people. They are elect. They are remnant. They are the true Israel of God, the true church, the ones that are circumcised in the spirit and not just in the flesh. That's the truth. Okay, and here's what happened. Those people die because of their sinful in the flesh, because of their inherited sin nature from Adam. But a new generation of believers comes along and replaces them. So God always has his elect. He always has his remnant. And each generation of elect and remnant replaces the one before it whether they're national Israel or whatever their nation they're of, it doesn't matter. Because people who say that the Jews, people who call themselves Jews, whether we don't know whether they really are, I might be, I might have true Hebrew blood, not even know it. How could I know it? You know, there's uh, several scriptures that I uh, brings to mind. That's, uh, how about this one here? Mm. Ah, yes. Okay. We're in Acts 17, 26. Um, he's talking about the God that gives life to all and breath and all things and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So there's no longer Jew or Greek. We're all of one blood, going back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. We all came out of Adam and Eve, and it gets back to that. They were the beginning of the seed line of faith. Believe me, Adam and Eve never became unbelievers. They will be there in the resurrection with us. And all of the promises yeah, made to Adam and Eve and all of the patriarchs are fulfilled in Christ. Read it in, in uh, Genesis chapter 3 the seed of the woman. All the promises are fulfilled there. So my replacement theology is that, yes, each generation of elect, true believers in the spirit is replaced by the next generation. Doesn't matter. Now, even before 70 AD, um, before the 70 weeks ended, prior to that, uh, God grafted in people from other nations into Israel. Anyone could be part of his holy nation. They could be grafted in and become true believers in Israel. At the same time, there were true unbelievers in Israel. There were the, those that were not elect, and even those that were proselytes, as were some of the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day. They said it. They proclaimed. They told who they were. They said, we're Abraham's seed, and we've never been in bondage. What they were saying is that they were the seed of Abraham, but they were not the Hebrews, part of the Hebrews that came out of Egypt. They came out of bondage. They were Edomites. Yeah, Abraham was the father of the Edomites. Sorry, yeah, all of the Arabs. He was the father of the Arab nations. Uh, so... They could claim that Abraham was our father, but we were never in bondage. And that's, and see, people who claim to be Jews today, well, they may or they may not, and most likely they are not actual sons of Israel. They may be Edomites. They may be, or they may not even be Edomites. Hey. They could just simply be proselytes because they're, you read, uh, what is it, the Lost Tribe. I believe there's a book out there called The Lost Tribe or The Thirteenth Tribe or something like that where it, it runs down through a history where, uh, where there were nations that were, that were turned to, they became, the whole nation by law became Jewish. <laughs> but they were not Jews. They were proselytes Jews. They imported uh, teachers from Israel to teach them Judaism, but they didn't have a drop 
of Israelite blood in them. And that's probably most or at least a, a good part. Maybe a majority, maybe not. I don't really know what the, can't, there's no way I can know what the numbers are. And it doesn't matter. Going back to it does not matter because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So people calling themselves Jews and practicing Babylonian Talmudic Judaism, which is an abomination, really. Yeah. People practicing that are not God's chosen people simply because they wear the name Jew or live, they live in the land or a nation called Israel today. No more than I am. I, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote an article. There's an article on my website. Let me see if I can find that. And uh, yeah, the article is called God's Chosen People. And uh, you might want to check that out. But what, one of the tenets of my article here is this. Um, I write, 69 weeks had passed from the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. John the Baptist was baptizing in the River Jordan. And I move on. Um, Jeremiah was thrown into prison because his prophecies did not line up with popular eschatology. You can read that, all that there. Um, let's see. The disciples were witnessing. Oh, I said, now there were two camps in Israel. Going back to the time after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended to be, sit at the right hand of the Father. I said, now there were two camps in Israel. The, the obedient who would heed the words of the Messiah and sell their lands and make preparations to flee and take as many with them as would be saved. And they would take the gospel to the world. All that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions. And the Lord added to the church daily such as would be saved. Acts 2, 44 through 47 there. If by the word of the Messiah they did not flee, there were only two alternatives for those that stayed behind. They would fall by the edge of the sword or be led away captive into all nations. This was the fate of the disobedient. One camp followed the Messiah. One camp rejected him. Which camp were God's chosen people? The Jews who rejected them? And and their, uh, their descendants today that continue to reject them? Are they God's chosen people? And what, what were the, uh, you know, what were the disciples who, and, and all of those, those Hebrew and Jews that believed and followed the Messiah? What were they? Spilt milk? They were not God's chosen people? I need to rethink that, don't we? When, when people accuse you of replacement theology, this is what they're saying is that God's chosen people were the disobedient and their offspring and those that followed their religion to this day continue to be God's chosen people. However, the disciples and that those that followed the Messiah and those that carried the gospel to the nations and were part of the church that Jesus said, I will build, they're not God's chosen people somehow. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Okay. So, one camp followed the Messiah, one camp rejected him. Which camp were God's chosen people? As Ruth was grafted into Israel, and Rahab even making it into the lineage of the Messiah, so our God has always made provision for those of other nations to be grafted into his holy nation. He demonstrated that. During the seventieth week, when he said he said to the woman, I believe it was the woman at the well, or and, and one other that wanted to be healed or something, he said, "I have not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." But he healed and he ministered because they persisted. See, God has always provided, no matter what the time. He's always provided for those that come from outside the national Israel, from outside the church, into his church, whether it was the church was national Israel or whether it is the supranational Israel of today, because that's what the church is. When I say his holy nation, okay, um, Ruth was grafted in, Rahab even making it into the lineage of the Messiah. These were Gentiles at the time when Israel was a nation before 70 AD. Okay? 
They were grafted into his holy nation. That's even inside of Israel. Because Israel wasn't a holy nation as a whole. But inside of Israel, there was that remnant. There was the elect. That was the true holy nation. When I say his holy nation, I'm not talking about a nation of flesh and blood. For it is written that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But this was something new. This faithful remnant was being dispersed into all nations, becoming supranational rather than national. Remember, 70 weeks are determined for thy people. That was national Israel. The nation, the city, and the temple. Okay? They were dispersed in all nations, taking the gospel with them to call on as many as would be saved. All of the promises and covenants that God would made with Abraham and Israel are fulfilled in Christ. Are, and I'll add, will be. Because in the millennium, the whole church, right? The whole true Israel of God will be there. Whether it was pre-Israel, during national Israel, or after national Israel, the supranational Israel. We will all be there. Adam and Eve, and Noah, and Abraham, and Isaac, and... Uh, the disciples, the, the apostles, and every one who is part of the true church, who is part of the spiritual circumcision, will be there in the resurrection. All is fulfilled and will be fulfilled in Christ. God is not dealing separately. But we'll answer some of those other questions and perhaps your calls when we get back from these messages. You're listening to Across the Border, Prophecy Reality Edition. We'll be right back. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple Android device and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our listen and schedule pages on the internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. 